I, yeah, I think we, I, hopefully we can start. So I, I have the, the challenge or the privilege to introduce Cindy Sears. She's coming here today to talk a little bit and share her story with us. She um, has a very impressive career, as many of us know, um, including, you know, graduating from Thomas Jefferson, training at Cornell, and at Sloan Kettering and UVA, a uh, fa longtime standing faculty member at Johns Hopkins. Um, she has, is a past president of the IDSA, is the incoming editor for the Journal of Infectious Diseases, and that's all on the side where she runs her very successful laboratory and has mentored pre-doctoral and post-doctoral fellows as well as some of the you know, emerging leaders in, in our field. And I'm just very privileged to have her come and share her story with us. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. I really wanna thank Kathy and Nico and, and Diane for uh, the opportunity to be here today. I have to say, as I did this, I was like, it'd be much easier to give a data talk <laughs> to <laughs> think about how to present uh, my journey. But um, let me try to share my screen, hopefully successfully. And how about that say? Where did it go? Uh, okay. It looks good. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Oh, like on my screen. further screen. Yeah. Let me skip to the first slide then. And let me move to. I think after all these months, I'd be good at this. Um, and let me flip the display. Okay, does that look right now? Perfect. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, Kathy suggested the title, How to Grow a Career, and I'm going to try to tell you. Um, Cindy, can you change? We are seeing the presenter's view. Oh, you are. Yeah. Okay. Let me switch. Okay. Now Perfect. is it right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Very good. So um, I'm going to try to tell you about my journey. So these are my disclaimers. Uh, this is not a data talk. This is a personal experience talk. And so what I say could be irrelevant to your particular situation because careers are unique and lived experiences are unique, as you all know. So this is sort of where it started. You know, I was born in Reading Hospital. My mom was a nurse, um, but who became a homemaker. And my dad was a World War II vet who grew up during the depression, got a Purple Heart uh, during the war. And we, we lived really in a rural area. So I come from rural America, a small high school, no advanced classes. And uh, I grew up with uh, a serious chronic illness in the family. And, and that was that my mom had a very serious uh, mental illness. And when I look back at it, it's something I wouldn't talk about for years. But when I look back, I have to say to myself, it sort of makes HIV look simple, given the tools that we have today and the tools we don't have for those illnesses. Um, so I went off and did college and medical school in five years. Um, these types of programs don't exist anymore, but you basically spent one year in college and then you went to medical school. So I started medical school when I was 18 and then became an intern resident and ultimately uh, an assistant chief resident at New York Hospital, which is where I did that initial training. I spent about six months in a refugee camp. I became a general medicine fellow for about a year with Dr. Mary Charlson, who is the Mary Charlson of the Charlson Index. And uh, then I did a year of ID training with Don Armstrong, three years at UVA, was on the faculty at UVA for three years, and then at Johns Hopkins uh, since that time. My son was born uh, during my last at year at UVA, and then in 1992, I became a single mom. So that's sort of the background of who I am. And you can see the pictures there, my son with my mom and dad when he was about seven and us uh, together uh, just this last Christmas with my grandson born during COVID and I love being a grandmother. 
So I did write a little about my career a few years ago uh, for IDSA, and I think I would be called a physician scientist. I think I'm much more of a translational scientist, um, but I wrote about how this is such a diversified uh, definition, I think, within the field of infectious diseases. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit how I chose IV. And what you're going to hear throughout is the impact of serendipity and mentorship on my uh, career development. So Lori suggested to me that you would be interested in knowing how I made pivots in my career. And I, that became, as I thought about talking about this, um, a way to frame what happened uh, to me over time. So I have four pivots I'm gonna to describe to you. The very first was my pivot from general internal medicine to ID. Then my second pivot was really in the early 2000s when I moved from really being a pathogenesis of diarrheal disease researcher to global health and in, in global health. And then to working on this new bug called enterotoxigenic bacteria fragilis and all of a sudden landing in the oncology field, trying to understand how specific bugs and communities affect colon cancer. Then pivot number three was really just a few years ago uh, as I joined the IDSA leadership, you know, sort of doing everything became uh, too hard. So I had to make some choices. And the fourth pivot is what's in progress now. So I'll tell you what my thinking uh, is now. And if anybody has any questions along the way, please uh, interrupt. So pivot number one was how did I get from general medicine to ID? So as a resident, I loved GI and ID. And I, I don't know exactly why, but I've always found the biology of the gut to be really interesting. And I suspect it really was the people, you know, the attendings who I enjoyed uh, learning from uh, while I was at, at uh, the New York hospital. Uh, and since at that time, when I thought about it, well, if I don't know what I want to do for sure, well, then I shouldn't make a choice. So I decided there was a brand new general internal medicine fellowship that was focused on asking uh, learning epidemiology and asking uh, questions in the hospital setting. But this new head, Dr. Mary Charlson, who was really a spitfire, uh, out of Yale. And so I was always interested in asking questions. So I said, okay, that's what I should do. But then uh, a pivotal event intervened. And that was, I was asked to be assistant chief of service, which is sort of the helper uh, to the chief resident. And that led uh, to me hanging out in the chief resident's office, uh, talking to uh, him and, and, and the TV was on. And, we realized that the first story we were listening to is about veterinary care in New York City, which is perfectly absurd. Uh, if you open at that time the, the phone book, there were just lists of vets who just did eye care for cats or eye care for dogs. And meanwhile, you know, we're reflecting on the fact that we don't have enough resources for our patients. But then the second story was about Cambodian refugees who have been forced uh, who had fled Pol Pot and gone into Thailand and then got forced back into a very dense jungle area in Cambodia. This was a worldwide event and decried, um, not unlike what we're seeing right now. And uh, by the Thai military, they just pushed them back into the jungle and tens of thousands of Cambodians died. So Dr. Ted Lee, who was one of my co-residents, approached some of us about going to the International Rescue Committee to see if we could do something. And uh, what evolved was the IRC was desperate for doctors and caregivers on the eastern border of Thailand as this refugee crisis grew. And the Marfella residents said, oh, we'll do double time as uh, third year residents. And, and some of us went off and, and others stayed home. 
Now the context really matters because it was the same year that New York Hospital had the Shah of Iran hospitalized with his lymphoma, which is leading, leading to enormous bad press at New York Hospital. The hospital was ringed with protesters. And in fact, a, um, one of the floors got walled off and there were two people standing there with uh, machine guns to protect him. So we formed the Cornell team and we manned the emergency room of Kawidang, which was a seven square mile refugee camp on the outskirts of Ramyapitet, Thailand. And this is the camp where the final scenes of the killing field that they never have heard of was shot. Well, Dr. Don Armstrong, who's chief of ID at Sloan Kettering was my attending. And what ended up happening with this, this program actually spread through New York City and residents from multiple hospitals and attendings would rotated through Kawidang to take care of the refugees. And so here's just a map of, of Thailand and the little black circle, and you can't read it, is where Rania Pratet was, is a sleepy little village. And Kawidang was just north of that in a very desolate area, you know, not wisely chosen. They had to import all the water in trucks every single day. So what did I learn? Well, this picture, which I cherish, um, is illustrated, illustrates what I learned there. Um, this patient on the gurney there is a seven-year-old boy who at 7.30 in the morning was playing, began to have diarrhea, and arrived on our ward uh, without a pulse and not breathing an hour later. And of course, there's only one disease that does that, and it's cholera. Um, and so this is a picture of my translator in the back, Nawi Lim, uh, the two nurses who helped resuscitate uh, the little boy, another of our medical workers, and of course the boy's uh, mother, because he was successfully resuscitated and did well. Now, over the course of my first tour of duty there, and I went twice, we had epidemic waves of cholera, and I happened to be on in the camp on call overnight when the first case came in, which is uh, etched on my memory forever. Uh, but then we had waves of meningococcal meningitis, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, on top of everyday respiratory and diarrheal diseases. So as a resident, if I stayed overnight, I could end up with 60 patients to admit to the Kawidang Hospital, which was like, um, it was two hospitals. They were all like airplane hangars. And we would dispense, distribute the patients across these wards uh, in the morning uh, when everybody uh, came back in. Now you may ask, why did we have all these epidemics? Well, everyone, it was a huge miscalculation. Uh, by the International Red Cross, it was assumed that immunity to these childhood diseases would be high, but Pol Pot, as you may remember, was about separating out everybody, and as a result, immunity had waned, and they all crowded into a refugee camp, and uh, it was a deadly situation because many of the individuals we saw with these childhood illnesses were actually in their 20s, so of course we saw the complications of those illnesses. So this is just a picture of the killing fields and a brief description. Um, and the connection to Kali Dang is that the last scene of the movie was filmed in our rehab board, which helped the individuals who had stepped on mines and lost limbs and similar uh, because of the act of war zone. So the second thought provoking event I had at Kawidang that really made a difference was I loved it out there. It was so uh, amazing doing this. It's really the most transformative experience of my life. Um, should I go back and train an ID or should I become an international field worker? And then one day we had an eight year old uh, boy who had rheumatic heart disease. And we worked with international field workers who said, this boy should die. That's the natural history of this disease in this setting, and there should be no intervention. And those of us from Cornell were really 
repelled by that idea, although I suspect this happens all over the world. And so we, we petitioned the Thai government to take him to Bangkok and give him a vow. Now, I don't know the outcome of that, but we did succeed. And the young boy went to Bangkok and, and had the cardiac surgery. So what did I learn from being there? Well, I learned about the power of antibiotics and intravenous fluids. And I learned that my personal interest, I'd always liked procedures uh, and ICUs, just vanished. And so now I knew that I wanted to do uh, ID, not GI. So the second source of motivation came with the emergence of the HIV epidemic in New York City. And as a third year resident, I was uh, on my ID rotation and Dr. Henry Mazur, who you know is the um, head of critical care at New York Hospital, I mean at the, the NIH now, um, was my attendant. And we had, uh, this paper has the very first case of pneumocystis crani pneumonia, not, no longer called that, uh, in uh, New York Hospital and that uh, proved to be a case of AIDS. And I will never forget seeing that young man and Henry who studied that parasite or fungus, I, I can't make this transition very well, um, <laughs> um, you know, like was totally puzzled. And he, we all puzzled over this. And eventually, of course, this mystery was solved. The second name I've, I've, I've circled there is uh, Henry or Hank Murray, who was my chief resident uh, during uh, my residency. And Hank is about 6'5". Uh, he's a bit imperial. And he uh, sometimes made sport out of making residents sweat, shall we say. And what I learned from that was how to plant my feet, get my thoughts together, and stand up for myself in, in the setting of others. So I'm, I'm very grateful to him. He's actually a very nice man, uh, but he has a, you know, he had his way, shall we say, as a chief resident. I was also exposed to Drs. Barry Hartman and Jean Pop, who you may not know. Barry Hartman is one of the master clinicians to this day at Cornell and a, a very special person to be around. And Jean Pop is the lead ID physician in Haiti, who ultimately won the highest award of the French government for his work with the HIV epidemic. So my point here is mentorship is short and long. So in a number of settings, people can influence you, teach you. They may not be your ongoing longitudinal mentor, but there are many uh, cues and, and information I've learned uh, around a lot of people during this period of time. So after returning uh, from Cali Dang, now committed to IV training, I had committed to doing this uh, general internal medicine training with Mary Charlson, and I did a year, and I'm grateful for that year because I learned some epidemiology. I published my first paper. She shepherded me through my first talk, uh, all of which were terrific experiences, but I did leave that fellowship after one year because Don Armstrong, who had been my attending in the refugee camp, offered me an interim year training, IV training, and Memorial Sloan Henry. And that was the year that HIV swamped uh, New York City. So it was, again, a remarkable uh, experience, including sitting in the basement of the hospital, pulling data with an EIS officer from the CDC for the first report of lymphadenopathy in um, young men uh, who ultimately proved to have uh, AIDS. Um, meanwhile, I applied for formal fellowships and went to work with Dr. Richard Grant, who's internationally renowned for his diarrheal disease research and an advocate for global health and equity. Um, I learned um, through many mistakes uh, how to do laboratory uh, research. And so I'm extremely grateful for what I learned uh, about the process of experimentation from Dick. 
But he also sent me to a basic science laboratory led by Dr. Julie Sando, who's a brilliant basic scientist and never dealt with a physician. Um, but we really hit it off. Um, and this is before word processing, believe it or not. And she would sit down and write her grants uh, longhand with a pencil, make minor adjustments, type them up, and send them to the NIH. And she, once upon a time, got a perfect score. Um, she helped me with my first grant and dubbed me the queen of the misplaced modifier. And uh, to this day, I'm still looking for misplaced uh, modifiers. <laughs> so what are my takeaways from this first pivot? Well, you should really, in my view, consider opportunities, be willing to be a bit adventuresome, take some chances. Listen to your heartbeat, know thyself. I'll say that several times. You know, if it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. If it feels good and feels interesting, it probably is, you know, the path that may make the most sense for you. Be keenly observant. I feel like I've learned so much from just watching other people navigate uh, in, in our environments. And I truly believe you must love what you do in order to do it well. We're all working too hard to do something that doesn't really resonate with us. So pivot number two, which really encompasses the bulk of my career here at Johns Hopkins was, you know, I was a global health diarrheal disease from the refugee camp uh, person. Um, and then I came to Hopkins and got introduced to a new project that led me in a totally different direction. This is like a total right-hand turn. So I was recruited to Hopkins by GI, despite my ID background. And that's because Mark Donowitz's brother, Jerry Donowitz, was at UVA and he liked toxins and he liked some of the work he'd done with entamoeba histolytica. And so he wanted an ID person in his group, which was fabulous for me. Um, and at that time, my goal was to study GI pathogens and mechanisms of bacterial toxins. And I had a project, like a program project with um, Dick Garant in Fortaleza, Brazil, where we were saying cryptosporidium. Now today, this is probably being, would be called being too diffuse, but I had a fabulous setup uh, trying to do international work and some laboratory work. But then again, something happened. And what happened was uh, Brad Sack, who is a leading diarrheal disease researcher who we sadly lost about five years ago, um, called me up and I knew his name because I was studying diarrheal diseases and said, can I come talk to you? And I'm like, sure, you know, I'm a junior faculty member. I was absolutely uncertain why he would want to talk to me. And so he came to my office and he came with a black tube of concentrated culture supernatant from a new organism that they had identified as a diarrheal disease pathogen in the White River um, uh, Indian Reservation. And he said, you know, we can't, we can't like figure out what this toxin is and when none of our assays are working and I hear you work with epithelial cells, we just take this and see what you can do. So I did. Um, and his uh, colleague was Dr. Lyle Myers, who's a PhD veterinary person at Montana State University, fabulous researcher who really was the first one to identify that there might be a toxin made by Bacteries fragilis. And the three of us worked together and we were fortunate enough to figure out an assay and purify the toxin and find the gene, all that kind of stuff. And then, we started to work from there. And so when you're looking at building a research career, in my opinion, again, I think you have to follow and build on your data, even if it's not what you anticipated. I think it's important to be attuned to cross-disciplinary concepts, to seek expert help. You can't do everything yourself. There is no point on the planet of trying to learn every assay. So find people who are good, at new assays that you need to employ and get their help. Um, and always turn your data into papers. That is the currency of our field. 
So this project took me to the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research, where I got to work with Dr. Fadalsi Kandre sitting there at the table. And we went there to try to understand the clinical aspects of being uh, infected with enterotoxigenic bacteria fragilis. And it got named that because it was thought it was like enterotoxigenic E. coli, but it's nothing like ETEC. It's in fact much more like Shigella. And that's what we learned there. Meanwhile, back in the laboratory, we were also bumping into these inflammatory pathways, and then we started bumping into cancer pathways. And eventually I went to Dr. David Fusseau, one of Hopkins veterinary pathologists who we sadly lost also about five years ago. And he gave me about seven mice that were susceptible to colon tumors because of a gene mutation. And we colonize those mice and you don't have to be a pat veterinary pathologist to tell that those slides are different. So I would say to you that the best result is the one that you don't expect and you don't anticipate because that just broadens your horizon to think about new things. And of course, that's where I took a total right-hand turn. I'm not an oncologist. I'm not an immunologist. But I got, I worked have, and have now worked with those individuals for 20 years um, to try to attack how bacteria in particular may be influencing colon cancer, either at the single species level or at the community uh, level. So who are we today? Well, in the top left is a picture of biofilms. And one of our key findings was that over half of human colon cancer has these phenomenal clusters of bacteria that are sitting on top of the tumors and also invading the tumor. And in the process of trying to deconvolute that in the lab on the right, you can see a mouse colon and you can see those little bumps, which are tumors. And what we identified in the paper we're trying to revise now is that some strains of Clostridioides difficile are pro-tumorigenic, and we're trying to understand that. This is a project that I thought was a summer project for a few students about four years ago, and that we would take it off the plate, and I was just wrong. And so now four years later, we're finally uh, writing the first paper. So our overarching goal is to try to figure out a way to use the microbiome to improve prevention and therapy in human uh, colon cancer. And then about five years ago, I was asked to lead a new project in the, in the Bloomberg Kimmel Institute here on how the microbiome influences uh, immunotherapy. And that, project. We had not a sample, not a person. And today we've enrolled over 400 patients and have over 1,200 samples uh, in the freezer, and we're working on our third and fourth papers. So it was really fun uh, to build this team. Of course, doing all of this takes funding. And my one piece of advice would be from the very get-go, try to diversify your funding. I'm not going to say that's easy. And I think I'm um, uh, just very grateful that over time we had these opportunities to uh, obtain funding from different sources, such as our internal institute, Bloomberg Kimmel, sort of your standard R01s. Uh, HTAN is a human tumor atlas network, which I actually have a project with Vanderbilt, uh, Bob Coffey there. Uh, the UK CRUC is an international consortium, which I had the opportunity to work. And then we were fortunate to attract some industry attention. And now the young people in my group are getting uh, grants, uh, which I'm excited about. But I would say to you, it's really all about the people. It's all about the team that you build. And right now I have 16 in my group. I never dreamed I would have uh, this size of a group, and they range from faculty to high, a high school student who's fabulous, uh, to people who support us and graduate students and an MD, PhD student. And I've been a majority woman lab for the better part of the last 10 years. 
And I've also been extremely fortunate to have a diverse lab, uh, which has, um, I think, really uh, taught us all many important things. And we, over time, we build collaborators both within and outside of companies. So I want to show you the team uh, of whom I'm very proud. Um, these are some of the individuals. I don't have time to tell you about each of them. And then this is the team that really working from the clinic back to the laboratory uh, that's working on the immunotherapy project. And in, the, in there, we realized we needed a germ-free mouse facility and the, the dean was generous, deans both in the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health were generous enough uh, to support that new endeavor. So I think my takeaways from pivot number one um, apply here as well. <clears throat> but I would say the additional takeaways from this phase of my life is really follow your data as I think this fosters discovery. Be alert to new things outside your field because they may help you take steps you would never think of. Do publish your papers. Writing, I'm, I'm not the best writer in the planet. Uh, writing is very hard. It takes a lot of time uh, to do this, but sit down and do it because there's real reward in summary, summarizing your results and getting them into uh, publication. Uh, build your environment as I really think the people you work with are it. I can tell you I've had interviewed postdocs who were brilliant, uh, but I always make sure people speak to people in the lab. Um, and there have been individuals who didn't um, rub people the wrong way, and I always listen to that. So we have turned down people who probably have, will have fabulous careers, but not in our environment because we work too hard, we have to work together. And so I, I care a lot about esprit de corps. And I didn't really get a chance to say much about it, but I also chose to be IV fellowship director at Hopkins from, for about 15 years. So I think when you join a faculty, you have to be willing to contribute, but you, you surely should be selected. So make sure you choose something that you really wanna do. And one thing I've always enjoyed is working with uh, students and residents and fellows. And at the point I started doing this, I really felt like I had managed to fall in every ditch along the way. I mean, I have some great stories that would make you laugh, but you know, I crawled out of those ditches and, and kept going. And, and my real goal was to try to uh, help people not make some of the silly mistakes that I had made. So pivot number three, which is relatively recent, just a few years ago, uh, four decades really here, I did all the clinic, same clinical rotations and um, clinics as anyone else, I ran the lab. Um, but over this period of time, I got involved with IDSA. Uh, over many years. And, and this is, was, is, was, and is an extraordinarily important part of my career. And, and to be honest, uh, this offset some disappointments here at Hopkins. You know, now about 20 years ago, I went to a couple of senior people to, you know, talk about leadership opportunities and things like that. And I was told point blank that there was no place for me in the leadership at Johns Hopkins. So then, you know, and I think back to that and um, I realized I didn't even ask why. I think I was so stunned and, and disappointed, it's probably a mild world word, um, that I didn't even ask why they said that. Um, so by getting involved with IDSA, I really got involved with a different type a group of people who are incredibly supportive and very, very positive. And so for me, it was a terrific experience. And I didn't put this long list to impress you, but to uh, say that involvement with anything takes time and effort. 
And what I would say is, you know, I worked on committees and then I got to be chair of the program committee, which was an important position. And then I was elected to the board. And that's actually when I served with Kathy, a very memorable time. Then I worked on more committees. And then I was asked to run for treasurer of the society. And that was a position I held for six years. Then I worked on more projects with the society. And then I was elected to the leadership track, which is a four-year track, which is when I became president of IDSA in 2018 to 2019. And when I got there, I just realized uh, there weren't enough hours in the day for me to do everything. And I made the choice to do less clinical time and to uh, focus in the lab, which had grown at that period of time. So this summarizes much of what I just said, but I, what I wanted to add was by working with IDSA, I had these really interesting opportunities to think at a national level uh, for our, our subspecialty. Uh, I got involved, much more involved in inclusion and diversity issues. I got to speak to the NIH about fostering physician scientists. So it was a very, um, it helped me see, have a much broader perspective within infectious diseases. So I would say that my, key takeaway here was that engagement with your national organizations really fosters career growth and development, but there, is, there was a downside for me. I miss uh, being on the clinical service as much, and it, it is something I, I think about and I struggle with, but I can't figure out how I'm, I would be able to do it well, at least uh, not just now. And then pivot number four is what's in progress. You know, I have wonderful young people in the lab um, who I really want to turn things over to and help create more opportunity for them. So I'm strategizing about how best to do that. That was in part, part of my motivation to apply for the editor-in-chief for JID, take up something new, move away, and make space. Uh, for people to the, the junior faculty to grow. Um, and in the same process, I'm a little bit reinventing myself. Um, and uh, so I was fortunate enough to get a grant last fall on a totally new topic. And this was um, what's called early onset colorectal cancer, which is in bloom across the globe. There's nothing known about it from a uh, microbiome or organism perspective. So we're taking some interesting approaches and we've just started enrolling patients. So it also brings me back in touch with patients a little bit more. So um, an exciting opportunity. So I think I would be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, being a woman in medicine. I would call this a very complicated topic. There are people much uh, more scholarly on this than I am. And I also think, you know, I did come up at a time when I was the only woman in the room, so sort of that classic picture, and I do think things have uh, improved. But macro and microaggressions do persist, pay disparity persists, harassment does occur, and unconscious bias is real. So the one piece of advice I have here is to be careful about your assumptions. So I've had a couple rounds of situations where I initially assumed the negative, but when I got to know the person better, when I realized what I really was looking at was humans being inelegant at at uh, communication, uh, which happens a lot. And, and uh, Kathy may remember this. Um, we were at the board meeting for IDSA and this little piece of paper got passed around the table to me. And it said, the two men sitting across from you are laughing about how they let a teenager onto the board. And I guess at that time, I looked younger than stated age. Um, so it was a little demeaning. So I made the decision to sit with them at dinner. I just 
pulled my way into a seat at their table. And, you know, to convince them really that I was a colleague, not a teenager, sitting on uh, as part of the board. And, and it worked. We became friends. Um, it, this, this type of approach doesn't always work. I've had one experience where I attempted this and I failed miserably. Um, but I'm, I exclude that person from reviewing my papers or my grants. I will also say less words can be more. Sometimes we wanna explain ourselves too much and sometimes less really can be more because you're forcing the other person to fill in the gaps and to think more about what they may be saying uh, to you. Uh, the things in parentheses are things I've done. I'm not sure I recommend them, but I have used a fixed stare to, uh, to create some power for myself in a situation. Um, and it generally works because if you can hold that stare, people will look away. And I went through a period where I was so irritated uh, with the microaggressions that were occurring that I just said, I'm not calling any male leader by doctor for a period of time. And for probably a year or two, I deleted all titles and simply learned all their first names and just called them by their first names because we were colleagues. Now, I'm not sure that was a good idea, but I have to admit, nobody reacted. So it was a very interesting thing. They were, I mean, I, things would happen towards me, but I'm not sure they actually realized, uh, like, which is what a microaggression is. They didn't really realize the impact of their words. So the other things I would say is, if you think about yourself, we all have weaknesses. Uh, these often define strengths, in fact. So I am, can be hopelessly stubborn. Um, I didn't always pause before reacting, a very bad idea. Um, but these areas, if you recognize them, can be ways to help yourself. And so what do I mean? Well, stubborn is just an extreme form of being determined and dedicated. So if you tone it down a bit, you can turn that into a strength. And I am convinced you can say almost anything. As long as you are calm, your voice is neutral, and you're positive. And if you don't know what to say, you can uh, say, I, I'll have to think about that. I'll get back to you. Um, and it reminds me of talking to uh, trainees and asking them how they think about their performance. They almost always tell you exactly what you were about uh, to tell them. So I think we can know ourselves and then uh, use that information uh, to help us navigate our careers better. So I'm no expert on work-life balance. I don't necessarily do this well. But again, I would say, know your priorities. Mine was always my son, um, and everyone knew that. I really enjoy the outdoors, so that um, bolster, bolsters me up. And I'm pretty low maintenance, so I was able to keep it simple. But the constructs of well-being are quite personal, and you have to think about what uh, you want to be strategic. Uh, and I tell even junior faculty, no is an exceptionally good word. Be flexible. Uh, my son did travel baseball. We drove 300 miles a week, it made me crazy. And during that period of time, I ate McDonald's most of the time. And there was no way to make a meal. So be able to be flexible, I think. And, and, and Dr. Edwards, is the master of touching each email once. Uh, I only have one other person I've ever seen who can do what I've seen uh, Kathy do. Um, be prepared for crises. We had a house break in. I made sure my babysitter and Griffin were safe. I had a grant due the same day. And I just let the police take care of things until I could get there, but I finished the grant. 
Um, I would say pay for competent help. Think about what you need. Um, I I was very uh, willing to do this, and you know, eventually it all works out. I think um, it does help to cultivate a good sense of humor. So Griffin brought lice home. I brought scabies home. My childcare person's car broke at 5 a.m. on the time I was first giving medical grand rounds. And there had never been a second grader at uh, medical grand rounds, but there was that day and it worked out just fine. So I would be careful and do what you want. Um, make sure uh, not to leave the experiences of life behind. I've had a series of women in my office just in a panic about maternity leave. And I say, just let it go. It's a very short period of time. And, and it's absolutely not important. So identify your goals, prioritize, decide, do reflect, but just move forward as, as best you can. And don't overinterpret uh, people being people. Um, you're not alone. We are a very friendly field. And so you really can contact people to get input and advice on your career, in my opinion. So just a few final thoughts before we have some questions. Um, do what you love. Without passion for your work, I don't believe we can succeed. Be reflective and willing to change. Uh, make sure to work in an environment and with people uh, that you enjoy. Uh, be part of the solution. Um, I've heard many leaders complain, if you will, about someone coming in unhappy about something. So I would strongly, if you have an issue, a complaint, a concern, go in with possible solutions. How, how, how to make things better. Think that through because that will be a much more, make you, um, leaders will be much more willing to listen to you. And, and do take time uh, to celebrate the rest of life and to give to those less fortunate with you. And we all hope life is long. And so for me, my outside activity is working with a local uh, nonprofit called Movable Feast which is uh, feed people, fight disease, foster hope. Uh, and I am part of a bike team. So for one uh, weekend a year, I am Spinderella, not Cindy Sears. Uh, and our team is called Fierce Chicks Rock. And uh, this year will be my 17th year uh, riding uh, with them. So Dr. Edwards asked me a series of questions. And I, hopefully the first Hopefully I gave you a sense of how my career developed. Uh, I was very touched by what uh, Kathy wrote here about um, how I lead. And I don't have an answer to that except to say, I think the combination of my background and experiences and the fact that I'm really not ambitious. Now it is fine to be ambitious, but I do think it changes the calculus. Uh, to some extent for your behavior. Um, I do get down as I've relayed, but I can really, I really figure out ways to focus, read a book, go outside, just do something else until I can pull myself uh, up by the boot, bootstraps. And I, because of when I came through, I have uh, one male colleague who's a very a uh, strong advisor now, but a lot of my advisors are nurses and social workers, which were the female companions uh, that often surrounded me. And hopefully I've convinced you that uh, Griffin was number one, now my grandson is number one in my life. So I have much gratitude and many people to thank um, who in bigger and smaller ways, uh, help me along. And those are family, friends, my mentors, my colleagues, my research teams, my collaborators, IBSA, and of course our funding resources. And these are just some pictures uh, from the lab over time, um, having fun and doing our work. So thank you so much uh, again for uh, asking me to talk to you today. Let's see if I'm
Yeah. Well, I, Cindy, I hope you have a chance to look in the chat because it's really, it expresses our, our thanks um, and the fact that we've been very inspiring. I think that this is a great opportunity for some of our, you know, participants to ask you questions about this and, you know, they can be as, as open or as personal as people would like. You've certainly been very open with us and we appreciate that immensely. I can't actually see the chat. I don't know what happens here. Uh, I don't know how to make it better. But please ask questions. I mean, yes. you all, I'm sure you, you're, uh, you know, I would love to hear what you're facing um, and, and how maybe, you know, it, it helps me think about what I do and in trying to help the young people than I work with. Let, let me ask kind of a sensitive question. If you had one do-over, what would your do-over be? And you can say you don't have any, and, and I would agree with that because every, everything gets us to where we need to be, but just curious if there are, if there are things that you wish you had tried. I don't know if it's so much what I wish I would try. Like I said, I miss seeing patients. And when you're not in that world and you've been a, in that world for so long, you end up, our division has gotten very large. So I don't know uh, everyone as well as I did for really a very, very long time. Um, and plus what I do has thrust me <clears throat> into the oncology world and more in the GI world and things like that. And so, you know, I would say I'm a little jealous of all of you being in the uh, vaccine world, which is, you know, is ID to the T. So, you know, I, I follow my data. I have no regrets about that, but I do see this other uh, piece um, where uh, it maybe could have been a different path. Any other questions from the group? I just want to thank you, Cindy, um, for this is wonderful and so inspirational in really walking through all of these. And, and, and I think also to remind us that there were a number of times when you were in the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and certainly I think that that's important as, as well. Um, so thank you. I, I'm so excited for your um, next chapter of leadership and, and leading the JID. And, and, uh, and certainly I, I hope the mentees will, um, will use your, your knowledge and skills to send their papers to you as well. So, yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cindy, just thank yeah. you so much. There's a couple of people that have your hands up. Erin, Shara, and Felicia. Erin? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much um, for your talk. It's very inspiring. Um, I have um, a complaint and I don't have a solution. Um, <laughs> so my complaint is that our country and our employers um, still, I think, um, don't do a great job of supporting families with young children um, and and or children with special needs. And this was so highlighted in the pandemic. Um, and and I, I mean, Emory basically, when I went to one of their things, and I'm not trying to ditch Emory, um, but I'm just saying like, they said basically like, you need to tell us what you need. And I thought that was such like a put the problem on us, um, which is not helpful. Um, and I just, I really think that this happens everywhere. And I think it happens in all fields and, and um, and I don't know, again, I don't know what the solution is, but I, I feel like it needs to play a role because I did not have childcare for seven and a half years, the first year of my faculty position. I mean, months, sorry, seven and a half months. And this group has heard me say this before, but you seem to have great passion and, and, and sort of leadership and you're true to yourself and your family. So I feel like, you know, I mean, you may not have an answer right now on the spot, but I just... And maybe you recognize this, but I don't know. I, I know other people on this group have struggled with this before too. So I would just say that that's a thing for me. So um, anyway, that's it. But thank you so much. And I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And your comments are correct. You know, childcare is a huge issue today. And it's so, I mean, I it is it was expensive when I did it. It is 
off the charts uh, now. And I, so, you know, what Build Back Better, you know, the, there are things that the federal government, I think, should do. I don't have a good solution for that. I have to say I spent a lot of my income on childcare for a long time. And the one mistake I made was I didn't continue it when Griffin was a teenager. And I, I, I learned, you know, he was a teenager. Uh, he was a teenager, teenage boy, and he challenged me to the T and <laughs> took me to the mat over and over again. And if I had to do it again, I would have paid full time for someone to just be in the house uh, when he arrived. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's 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 it is a huge problem, I think, in our society, in, including it's an equity issue, you know, getting kids into pre care, you know, getting them that structure. Um, I really feel terrible when I see children on the streets in Baltimore and there's no adult nearby and they're way too young uh, to be out there on their own. It, it sort of breaks my heart. Yeah, but I think like from a perspective of faculty, like we just heard so much about, oh, I have so much time to write grants and I've never been so productive and I have so many papers that I can write. And yet all of us with young kids at home were could barely keep our lives together. And it was very challenging. And so it was just like, we were totally ignored. So anyway, but I, thanks so much because you've said some great things and I'll take them to heart. I'll listen. Thank you. Alicia? Um, I appreciate Erin's candidness because I feel a lot of her pain, but that is not my question. As someone who spent all my grant writing periods after 10 p.m. at night after I would fold laundry, <laughs> so I, I appreciate Erin's comment. But my question was actually about, um, you know, with the pandemic, which has dominated my entire faculty experience thus far, where we have a lot of virtual options, it ends up being that you are supposed to be working all the time time and available all the time. How do you set some of those boundaries when it comes to emails and phone calls in this new, this new world that we live in? Yeah, I, I agree that that is an issue. And so there's a lot more discussion about quiet time and, and just turning it off. Um, I think sometimes, I, I think you have to think about that. I've had periods during the pandemic where, you know, I'm shocked that I'm feeling a little anxious uh, about all of this. And so I've just, like, actually, it's been a tough February and I'm going to the Eastern Shore tomorrow to create some space and ride my bike and so I think you have to make conscious decisions to take care of yourself. I, I am not good uh, when, I was probably better when Griffin was little because I, you know, I took care of Griffin and that got me away from everything. Uh, but I don't have that distraction uh, now. So I, I'm working on not working on weekends because the weeks are so crazy that the only time I can think, read, write is on the weekends, but I'm quite weary of it and am on my own personal mission to make this different uh, over the next, you know, it does, nothing happens in a day. So just keeping it on your priority list and just trudging towards that goal. It's not great advice, but you know, it's the best I can do. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because one discussion I had recently was, you know, I've used almost all my PTO for when my kids have to be out of childcare for COVID testing. And my only vacation I've taken is for a funeral. So that kind of advice for the leadership to be, I think it would be really useful. I think if there's any other questions that, you know, that, that you'd like or, or comments or, or things, I'm sure Cindy would be happy to 
address them in email if you, you have um, have other questions or, or whatever, um, for sure. Um, for sure, yeah, don't, don't hesitate to email. I'll, I'll do my best to answer your question. Um, but I admit many of these issues are very difficult. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, and and uh, uh, best of luck in your next phase. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I, I wish you all all the best as you develop in your careers. Um, it's a fun field; you'll have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.